blessing you give us each day. We thank you for the love that came from the cross for, the, for this class this morning that we have opportunity to gather and study from our from the Bible. Father, we are thankful for each and every member of this congregation, and we're especially uh, in our hearts for now, right now, those that are dealing with the health issues. We ask your special blessings on Brother Mickey and Tom and Sandra and others that may be that were mentioned this morning. And Father, we ask you to bless this church, continue to provide for our needs, continue to keep us in fellowship with one another. Go with us now through this class and through the rest of our service this morning, through our worship. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. While we're on the topic, before I jump into my class, there's another sneaker among us. Betty Hall looks a lot better than she is. Uh, Betty has significant breathing difficulties and some days is unable to get out at all. Today's one of them. Uh, but uh, she, she struggles uh, more than you might imagine. All right, Acts chapter 8, verse 32. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this same scripture, preached Jesus to him. All right, where was the the Ethiopian man reading it from? Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. What is Isaiah chapter 53 about? Chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. That is where the Ethiopian eunuch was reading in a scroll almost 2,000 years ago, not quite, as he was driving along from Jerusalem going toward Gaza on his way home. Now, there are several interesting things about this. Uh, we won't get to nearly all of them. Number one, if you were reading this in the Old Testament, would it be confusing? Answer, yes, it would. Why would it be confusing? Because there's no identification of the, of the person. It's just he. Now, who is the he? Several other interesting things about it. First of all, the, you know, the trauma that's there. There are a lot of factors that are described here um, in Isaiah 53, and it would be easy for our class to, to turn into that only, but uh, we won't. Um, Grow up before him as a tender plant, root out of dry ground. What is a root out of dry ground? What, is, what does it mean to grow up out of dry ground? Come up unexpectedly. You, it, it, you shouldn't have this. It's, it's not, it's not uh, this is not the way things happen. Uh, no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. One of the statements made about Absalom, 
and some others, but Absalom was that uh, he was an extremely handsome young man. The people were drawn to his, his charisma. He was, you know, you've met people, uh, you may know people, maybe you are people, who people flock to because of, uh, of your personality or, or how you look or behaviors of various sorts. There are folks around us that are attractive. People are drawn toward them. Others are not. They are, I'm not going to say they're, they're unattractive. We usually think of that as being um, not very pleasant to look at. Unattractive just means that it's, you're not something that draws toward you. Um, that's not how we use that word, but that's the word itself uh, from an English standpoint. It, uh, if something is attractive, the opposite is unattractive. does not mean to dispel. It just means that there's no, there's no attraction there. If I had a magnet, and I don't, anybody got a magnet? <laughs> okay, I'll figure that. Uh, sometimes the, the, the lasers are magnetic, this one's not. Uh, if I had a magnet, and uh, this was a magnetic board, I could stick it up here and it would, it would just sit there. And um, this is a piece of plastic, I could sit up there and you know, clearly it would not, it, it would drop away. Well, the, the plastic does not repel, it just doesn't have that attractive force. The scripture doesn't say Jesus was ugly or that Jesus uh, was, uh, was not a person that people would like, but he was not special. He was not unique. He was not charismatic in that people were just drawn magically to him. This is just a normal guy. But you see what I just did? When we read Isaiah 53, it's not a mystery to you. Why? You know who it's about. You know it's about Jesus. And so you look at Jesus' life and you, we go, when we read it, we go, oh wow, how amazing that here we have this description of someone who so closely fits the life of Jesus. So we are amazed at, at what the prophet did 800 years before Jesus was born um, in predicting these things. But the Ethiopian, he's riding along and you notice something else interesting about Isaiah 53? It's written in past tense as if it is historically completed. There's a terminology for that. In Greek, it's referred to as the future perfect. That which is yet to be, but has been completed. Now that's a real interesting concept that uh, uh, that's there. Uh, that's like if I were to tell you that you're going on a vacation, the, the reservations have been made. When you get there, everything will have been taken care of. That doesn't mean they're taken care of now. It means that by the time you arrive, it will have been done. So that's, that's the concept of the future perfect. When Jesus told his disciples, and Brother uh, Miller said it, you may not have picked up on it in his seminar this last weekend. He said he told his disciples, the things you bind on earth, King James translates that, many other translations, will be bound. But the text is future perfect. The Greek form is future perfect, which means whatever you bind will have already been bound. So God, Jesus was not giving them the power to control the world. He was giving them the power to say, this is what God has already decided. He said, you are going to reveal the words of God. Well, here, as we read Isaiah 53, it's far into the future, 800 years or so, and yet it's written from the standpoint of it's already happened. So here's the, the eunuch reading this. How could he possibly understand Isaiah 53? You know what you're reading? How can I, unless someone should guide me, could they have worked out the mystery behind Isaiah 53 on their own prior to Jesus coming. Not a chance. No way. Even though it's written here, you, you couldn't put all those pieces together 
until after the fact. But here it is. So when Philip hears him reading this, and the Ethiopian then asks the question, I ask you of whom did he write this, of himself or of some other? Then Philip, beginning at the same scripture, preached Jesus to him. This passage is waiting for someone to say, this is Jesus, predicted by God in advance to occur just like this. Now wait a minute. If it was predicted in advance for this to occur, and Jesus is the fulfillment of it, what are the implications of that? Who's responsible for the actions of Jesus being afflicted and bruised and rejected and oppressed and... Does God predicting the future mean that God is causing the future? Could Jesus have known Judas was going to betray him without having been responsible for Judas betraying him? Was Jesus responsible for what Judas did? No. Who was? Judas. Judas was. Did Judas have a choice? Yes, Judas has a choice. In fact, the text is very clear to point out that Judas sought out the religious priest, the, high, the, the command, the rulers, and said, what will you give me if I bring him to you? They didn't approach him. This wasn't a sting operation. He was a defector. He went to them and said, I'm willing to betray my master. I know you want him. I'll give him to you. What will you give me? And so he does. Did God do that? Who's responsible for Judas's betrayal? Judas is. Who else? No one else. Judas made a choice. He was a free moral agent. He made a choice. Now the fact that God knew about it in advance and knew what was going to happen, does that mean you don't have free will? No, it does not. It means that God knows the future. When Isaiah wrote about Jesus, does that mean Jesus didn't have a choice? No, Jesus had a choice. It means God knows the future. So we have a very interesting situation. How do you explain Isaiah 53 unless you put Jesus in this? And then how do you explain it being there? Well, let's go back to Acts. He preached Jesus to him. What was included in that conversation about Jesus? I don't know. How long did it go? I don't know. It must have been a little while. Why? To pass by some water. They're in the desert to start with, and they come to water. So how far did they go? I don't know. There's not much water along there, but they came to some water, and it was after they'd already had some conversations. Their conversation included not only Jesus, but what else? What topic do we know was discussed under... Okay, we can do away with this. For those of you who did not get the riddle, you must not have seen the Florida-Alabama game yesterday when Alabama was playing in Florida and Florida had run out of uh, timeouts and suddenly the people could not run the clock. But anyway, that's you decide what that is. Conspiracy, <laughs> coincidence, inept. Somebody got in the sound booth that wasn't supposed to be there? I don't know. Okay. So here's the topic. What, what items were included under that topic? What do you think Philip talked about? Make a list of everything you think Philip talked about with the, Phil with the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, what else? 
How do you know he talked about baptism? Because he water. Water, he asked. What else did he talk about? Uh, the resurrection. How do you know? Well, that, that they are real. Well, we have lots of texts before that says that the apostles were really big on saying he died and he came back. The significance of Jesus, the point that Jesus said will show him to be who he claimed to be was the resurrection. This was not something that was occasionally included. This was a center point of it. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians one twenty one, we preach Christ crucified, this wasn't something that just occasionally came up. This was an always topic. The fact that Jesus died and was resurrected is the whole point of this. Died, that's that's that could happen to anybody. That's a normal process. The resurrection was abnormal. That's what set Jesus apart. So did they talk about the resurrection? Absolutely. Had to. What else? Other things that we can infer had to be in that conversation. Well, that Jesus was the only one. I mean, it had to be uh, his virgin birth. And had to talk about the Messiah. Okay. That might have included birth. What else? Miracles? Definitely. Absolutely. Because that's how Jesus proved that he was not a normal, ordinary guy. Miracles are not incidental to the conversation of Jesus. They're the center point. He went from place to place performing miracles, so the people had to say, how can he do this? And then you got, what are your options? Well, it's either not happening, we're all being misled, or it's happening because of some power. What power could possibly give Jesus the ability to do this? Nicodemus answers that in John 3. He comes to Jesus by night and said, we know you're from God. Nobody could do this unless God was with him. There you go. Did Jesus' contemporaries understand that Jesus had powers that must have come from God? Yes, they did. They understood it. They just didn't want to accept it. All right, so birth, miracles, everything in there. Forgiveness, sin, return. accountability. His return, too. The Lord's return. How long did they have? I don't know. There was a whole lot here. All right. Now, let's, let's single this one out for further conversation. Oh, I think we can do a better arrow than that. Let's try again. Okay, maybe I can't. All right. Um, all right, how can I do this diplomatically? All right, we will, we will name no names. Uh, we will identify no groups. Uh, we just talk about belief systems that folks hold to. Uh, what do people believe about baptism? Okay, let's let me give me a new column. People believe. Most believe this is not what you believe. This is just what folks believe. That water is involved in some way. Okay. Okay, hold on a second. We're going we're gonna do these one at a time. <laughs> I know that messes up the uh, uh, the the whole uh, brainstorming list process, but we're not gonna have time to come back. I just know that. All right, water's involved somehow. Does that include everyone? Well, Jesus said, unless a man is born of the water and spirit, uh, how do people push baptism out of that? They claim that water is the birth process and the Holy Spirit is the spirit process and there's no water in it. So, yeah, most people do that, but not all. Uh, but, yeah, most water is in there. Okay, Wayne, what'd you say? They don't believe it's necessary for salvation. Not necessary. Of course, there others believe that it is necessary. Not essential. Uh, what does necessary or essential mean? You've got to have it. Hmm? You have to have it. Essential is something you have to have in order. But the question is essential for what? Yeah. 
not essential for salvation. That's what uh, that's what Wayne said. Others believe it is essential okay. to have fellowship in the church, though not necessarily part of salvation. All part of your process. Yes. All right, let's talk about uh, not essential for salvation. What groups believe that uh, baptism is not essential for salvation? And I'm not asking for names. I'm talking. I'm, give me qualities by which we may identify characteristics. Okay. <laughs> yes, but let me let me help you along. Uh, maybe I should lead instead of. Let me offer some suggestions here. You're saved when Jesus. You 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 ask. Saved at your call. Yes. You guys. You make a plea. Do you guys really think you have the source material to make these statements? Because you're not really involved with this group. Those who believe uh, that salvation is by faith only, uh, I'm going to take this one out because that, although it's often along with that topic, that's really not the issue that creates the problem for them. This is one of the issues that creates a problem for them. Those who believe in faith only, that faith only saves you. If faith only saves you, Run with that a little bit. What what implication does that have? Well, they, they believe that it's not the works of man. They consider baptism as the works of man. And so it's not the works of man that saves you. So uh, that is where they, they base that on. It's pretty much one scripture for most of them. Um, so the significance of the belief in faith only is that God alone is responsible for salvation. God alone is responsible for salvation. I mean, if he gave you the path, you follow that path, and you're saved, you're saved by the rules that he, gives, that he set forth. Mm -hmm. So God alone set forth the rules. It's up to you. Now, yes, you can say that people... I need to redefine this then, if that's the conversation. God acts by himself without any response. No, I didn't say that. That's what God alone has to have. Acts without, see, the, the definition of terms is where we, we, we go separate ways. Okay, then. When, when we define our terms differently, we may use the same as baptism is necessary for seven. I did not say that. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> and that was why I decided to use it, was because how we define our terms is what puts us into different groups. And we sometimes are using the same vocabulary, but we don't, we don't mean the same thing by it. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I used a little phrase that's kind of hard to pick up on when it's just said out loud. I know you think you understood what you heard, or you know, uh, well, but what you don't understand is what you heard was not what I meant. We don't always use the same words to mean the same things. So when so one person says uh, that we are saved by God alone, does God by Himself act without any response from mankind to save men? That's offensive to some. To save, I can't even use humanity. Uh, anything with man in it has been ruled out. So, uh, give me another word. People. People, okay, I can give you Wow. Okay, does God act by himself without any response from people? To save people. Okay, now you do know that some people do believe that. That is exactly what they believe. They believe that God acts by himself without any response from people to save people. That's what they mean by faith alone. Now, 
the implications of that are significant. What is the problem with faith alone? Now, is this what they is this what they want when they say that? I don't know. It depends on the person and, and what they are. When Paul in Ephesians chapter two, I, th I, think, let's, I think I think the faith only concept there that you that needs to be broader because I didn't hear you, Tim. What the faith only concept needs to be broader in that they believe that their faith in God is what saves them. That is, that is what's preached. That their faith in God uh, saves them. That they don't need to be baptized. Okay? That is what they believe. There, there's not a single statement that would be representative of those who believe in faith only. I'm sorry. I'm the, in the churches where they say faith only. I know. But you know. There, there are lots of other... I mean, where, where did you say it's what did you say it's not in the Bible or not? That's, that's irrelevant. They're, they're different. What they believe regarding faith only differs from group to group. For example, about, uh, well, how long has it been? 25 years now? A religious group that I won't name had a convention in Dallas, Texas. And you know what the debate was about? Rewriting their creed. And the, uh, the specific point in, in controversy in the development of uh, rewriting their creed was to determine whether or not God gave people faith or not. Whether faith was a gift or whether it was something that people did on their own. Now, why, A, would they debate that? Because that's the <clears throat> foundation. Uh, basically, they take the thing that, uh, you know, there is none righteous, no, not one. Well, that God has to act on someone in order for them to respond. That is, uh, at least that's what I've read. Now that's, that is slightly onto a different topic. Well, that is the necess necessity of the Spirit to interact first to right. lead us well, there. It, this, this, that takes us into <clears throat> to, uh, uh, Calvinism, which does not identify any particular group, and the concept of total depravity, that yeah. humanity cannot even... You can't even believe until God gives you belief. So really what it was a debate about was whether Calvinism was four-point Calvinism or five-point Calvinism, but it didn't come out like that. Now, let me explain that. Tyler, I'll get you. Uh, it's important we understand the significance of this. Those who are truly faith-only, and when I say that, I mean it in the ultimate sense that... Uh, it is a belief system that saves us, or saves anyone. Uh, what is the source of the belief? That was the debate in Dallas. Well, so hold it. Well, this is this is it's the same same thing. Okay. So, but if if the if the faith comes from God. Yes. When you decide to believe. Nope. Then, well, you have made the decision, it, and that is the action that then saves you. You've said two things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I apologize. The gift from God and when you choose to believe. They're different. And this that was the debate on the floor in Dallas was, does God give you the gift of belief, or do you believe as an act of your own volition? See the difference? Now, this was the debate regarding faith only. Those who push it to the extreme, when they come to faith only, they still have a problem with where, what is God's action here. Some, the extremists, and I, I, I hate to use labels because that is sometimes prejudicial, those who, who were the um, most stringent on the idea of God only acting said that you can't even believe on your own. That unless God gives you the belief as a gift, you can't believe. All right, now let's just sit for a second and think about that. If you cannot believe in Jesus unless God gives you the gift, then who's responsible for salvation? I have seen an interesting 
God. This, which I will Who else? Discuss offline. Who else <laughs> is responsible for your salvation if God gives you the gift of belief? No one. And that's the whole thing. This group that argues this strong position does so. Now you're gonna you're, you're you may be thinking, well, that's 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 ludicrous. There's another terminology. There's, th this is all linked together. The person, the people who believe in the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, that is that God is everything. That means that nothing is done outside of the will of God. Nothing is done outside of the knowledge of the will of God. Nothing is done without God's direct interaction in it. Then God is sovereign. And if you do anything to, do, to act yourself, then you have taken away some part of God's sovereignty. That's what they believe. So you are diminishing their view of God by saying there's something that you've got to do in order to believe in order to be, to be saved. Or something you've got to do in order to be saved. Baptism is way down the list. They, they uh, get a lot closer than that. The argument was about belief. But pushed to its extreme, that's, that's what you have to do. The real debate between the groups, and they were all of the same denomination, and they were arguing about the meaning of faith only, was faith a gift or is faith the response of mankind? And, and here, is, here is the difference and where they go and why it's important. And this is going to affect a lot of things. If faith, or if, if God alone chooses who, who's going to be saved and who's not, then it doesn't make any difference what you do. God's decided. And that, it's, it's out. It's out of your hands. Calvinism, that's not the words Calvinists use, but that is the conclusion that you have to come by. If God is in total control, God decides, God acts, God saves you, God saves you completely, and the, the final one, the perseverance of the saints, once you have believed, it is in the power of God that God has done it, and you cannot act to take away God's power. You can't destroy His sovereignty, not even by sin. The sovereignty there becomes the issue of God. All right, the, the significance of this don't diminish the strength of how strongly people are going to connect themselves to this. And when you talk about that baptism has to be saved, well, clearly it says in Acts 2.38, uh, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Those who believe, who have been taught in that concept of God's sovereignty, they have been taught and drilled that everything is within the sovereignty of God. Nothing is outside of it. And for you to act in some way to change it would take away God's power. Therefore, you cannot, by yourself as a human being, you cannot do anything that brings you to salvation. And so for a group to come up and say, you must repent of your sins, you must believe on your own, your own volition, you must make a confession, you must be baptized, their response to that is saying, you're trying to work your way earn your way. You are doing something to achieve salvation and God alone has that right. Yeah. Now, there are 50 things in here that we need to talk about further, but anyway, who said this? Is that predestination? Predestination is... Because unless God comes up and taps you on the shoulder and says you believe, then you're going to hell. Predestination is involved in the doctrine of Calvinism. And the significance of Calvinism as a rule, often, we do not discuss religious doctrine from that point of view. We talk about other things. For this topic, right here, right now, we're going to have to talk about some doctrinal issues. So, don't, don't uh, come back, bring your thoughts. If you have questions you don't, why don't get to, and they will be there, write them down so we can address them when we come back. Um, anybody got a phone, take a picture of that and send it to me. I won't be able to reproduce it and they'll erase it. Uh, make sure you get all the words and, and uh, text it to me. Thank you for your time and attention.